When you work to make things that other people need, you relieve dire, dire needs. And that's a moral imperative in a world in which 80% of the people are living on less than $2 a day. Human beings are not concerned with just the truth, they're concerned with relevance. And this is because of uh, very powerful facts about agency in the world. The reason we haven't solved all the theoretical problems is that the math is equally complex. It's just not material, you can't see it. You see, I think that one of the troubles is that the term AI is just misleading. It's not artificial intelligence. 24-7, we can get cupcakes, cocaine, and pornography uh, whenever we want. We've been engaged in perhaps what you might call war on empathy. And so when I went to the Soviet Union, I immediately thought, oh, this is just like home. All the big killing were not done by private perverts who did it for fun. They were done for the good of the nation in the, in the highest moral terms. I tend to agree with you, this kind of, you know, good and then what doesn't fit it is evil. But now comes to me a key, key question. I think you, Rowan, were aiming also in a different way at it. But uh, those who protest the predominant form of good in a certain society, like women or slaves in a patriarchal society, do we necessarily have to use the categories of good and evil uh, to protest, like, this would be the classical criticism, no? where you say, sorry, you are saying you are good, but I can show how you are inconsistent, that it's not really good, it produces evil effects, and so on, and so on. So, is for you, if good is what is defined in the terms of predominant, male, so whatever, is resistance to good, necessary put in the same terms of good versus evil, or can we say, and I don't think we can, maybe in some versions of reference to Nietzsche, that there can be resistance which is not in itself morally grounded. That was the dream from Nietzsche to the less, uh, to the less and so on and so on. Just to conclude, then I will be shorter. The third thing, that's what I want to do think. I want to complicate things. That is to say, as you said correctly, my God, all the big killings were not done by private perverts who did it for fun. They were done for the good of the nation in the, in the highest moral terms. So I think that uh, the best argument against absolutization of any form of the good is not just the historicist one, it's relative. It's also to point out with an immanent critique how that form of uh, good produces necessarily catastrophic consequences. Like to conclude, and then I will speak less to Rowan. He's one of my eternal books. It's like I'm almost tempted to say like uh, Iliad, Homer, Sophocles, Dante, Shakespeare, and Rowan's book on Dostoevsky, <laughs> where, uh, <laughs> you know, he does something incredible. <laughs> Dostoevsky's idiot is usually playing that too good for this world, you know, pure and so on. No, he's really a catastrophic idiot. He does something horrible by being good in the wrong way and so on. He causes only catastrophe around himself. Look what happens to Nastasia Filipova, to other... You cannot say they are in themselves evil. It's uh, that uh, idiot Prince Mishkin triggers. He's good in a deeply wrong way. The best, the most evil intentions can... Sorry, evil acts can be justified by a certain form of evil. Uh, sorry, can lead to evil consequences. And that's crucial today. Everybody wants to be extremely good. The worst of Nazis, the worst of Stalinism, they were full of common good and so on and so on. 
for that recognition that, 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 that there is something there that I think is important about two entirely different ways of attending to the world. The prime difference between the hemispheres is the kind of attention they pay. And I'm not going to take up a lot of time on the hemisphere hypothesis, but what is important is that the left hemisphere um, sees these fixed things that the camera was photographing, as you referred to. So granular, atomistic, isolated, decontextualized, abstracted, fixed. Whereas the right hemisphere sees that in reality, everything is connected ultimately to everything else, that it's never completely fixed or known or certain, is knowable, and we can have greater degrees of certainty and truth about it, but it is not a final thing that exists out there. It is, comes from a relationship. And this is the really key thing. I argue in The Matter of Things that relationships are what the universe is made of, and that the relata, the things that are related, emerge secondarily from the web of relationships. I know that sounds paradoxical, but we have time to, to, to go into that perhaps too much. But the point there is that things only become what they are, those things we think we see, because of where they're situated in relation to everything else and the full context in which they inhere. And so that perception changes the way we think of knowledge. It's not that the stuff out there that we can more faithfully or other re otherwise record simply passively. It's something about if we really want to know it, we have to enter into a relationship with it. And that means that something of us goes into the experience of whatever it is we experience. No surprises in that. But it does not, I emphatically insist, does not lead anywhere near a sort of postmodern belief that we all just make it up. I, I resist that with every fiber of my being. I think instead we have a task, a duty, which is to follow truthfully our intuitions where they, where they seem to be testable and true in the experience of life. And that there is a truth, but it is something that we approach in a spirit of approximation and, and trust. In a relationship, you trust the other, and trust and truth have the same origin. So I believe that whatever it is that we know and experience ultimately comes out of relationships. And of course, in the Christian religion, but also in other religions, the ground of being, whatever word one uses to describe that, is love. And love is nothing except a relation. I was proposing that the distinction between the supernatural and the natural is a kind of reifying of a two worlds mythology that we inherited from the Axial Age. And it's been with us so long that we come to think of that as the de default way in which we should try to understand and express people's experience of the sacred. And I'll, I'll use that as neutrally as I possibly can. Something that they find really real that calls them to transformation in some fashion. That, I'm just going right. to put it that. We can right. talk about that. Right. But, and what, what, what I see, and I know I'm, I'm not pinning Sophie to being just a, a voice of Wittgenstein. So I'm addressing Wittgenstein, not, not Sophie. Um, I think Wittgenstein, of course, uh, that you can see the Tractatus as being bound up with this project of somehow can we find logic as the third realm uh, between the subjective and the objective. And Russell, of course, is, is in that project, and uh, Frege, too. Um, and I think that project, both in the analytic and the continental tradition, and there's a lot of argument to this, but I think that project has largely collapsed. Um, and a lot of the distinctions that made that project sort of viable um, have, 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 have collapsed. And I think Wittgenstein also was prescient about this, uh, because, of course, the investigations represents an alternative reinterpretation. Um, and so I'll, I'll throw another quote out, uh, which also has a mystical sound to it, because it puts you into silence, but a different way. Even if the lion could speak, we could not understand him. Because what he's pointing to, and what I would interpret he is trying to get at in the investigation and his whole theory of use, is that there are, are there actually multiple kinds of knowing. There isn't just propositional, there's procedural, there's skills, there's perspectival, what it is like to be in a particular situation. There's participatory, which is knowing by how your identity is taking shape. And these are all interwoven together. And that this has to do with something that is as important as truth, uh, which now I'll say something that, that is provocative, but is at the core of my career, which is human beings are not concerned with just the truth, they're concerned with relevance. And this is because of uh, very powerful facts about agency in the world. Uh, 
Uh, you can't pay attention to all of the information that's available to you. You can't pay attention to all of the information in long-term memory. All the different sequences of behavior are combinatorially explosive. The, the number of possible moves, in, even in a chess game, uh, outnumbers the number of atomic particles in the universe. So one of the projects I've been engaged in at, at the core of AGI is how do you get a system to zero in on relevant information? And this is what you can't get the system to do. Check everything to see if it's relevant. So th that means that human beings are doing this. You're all doing it right now. You're zeroing on, on relevant information. Things are obvious to you. Obviousness is not part of physics. But if you don't have a capacity for finding things obvious, you can't do any problem solving. You can't do any knowledge generation. So th this finding things relevant, th this is what he means about the lion. The lion has a different form of life. It's a different biological organism. So what it finds relevant and salient is going to be di very different from us. So even if it speaks English correctly, all, there might be you know, truth content there, but we won't get the relevance realization of the lion. And we won't be able to connect to the world the way the lion does. And I think that what people are often seeking when they're seeking belonging, and meaning, and I, this is what the research shows, we, we tend to think of it as purpose. Um, purpose is only one of the four dimensions, right? There's purpose, there's coherence, um, there's significance, and there ma there's mattering. And mattering seems to be the one that matters most, that pun is intended, uh, which is people want to feel that they're connected to something that has a reality and a, a value beyond their own egocentric existence and perspective. Um, Susan Wolf did some excellent work on this. And I think that is because we are not just seeking truth, we are seeking to be connected to it in a relevance realizing way. And um, I think what people are therefore looking for are not proposi just propositions or primarily propositions. In the past, almost everybody was desperately poor before the productivity revolution. In 1800, 80% of the world's population lived on the equivalent of less than $2 a day, just in material deprivation that's hard to imagine. Um, the productivity revolution is what ended that. And it ended that by thinking of work in a particular way. This is my second point. Uh, Adam Smith says near the end of the wealth of nations that the only purpose of production is consumption. And in a world in which almost everybody is desperately poor, that principle has a kind of a grim moral logic. Because when you work to make things that other people need, you relieve dire, dire needs. And that's a moral imperative in a world in which 80% of the people are living on less than $2 a day. Um, second point, though, is that the ability to flourish by consuming material stuff is bounded in our lives. We can consume only so much before we get sated. And at some point of every good and even money, more no longer makes us better off. That point is studied now actually by social psychologists and we are nearer to it than we think. Uh, in the United States today, GDP per capita is high enough that in principle, if there were no inequality, effectively every US American could have enough stuff produced by production with the sole aim of consumption to satisfy every material need that can make a human life go better. So we are reaching the point at which the drive for productivity is receding from its moral imperative. At the same time, more and more production is harming the planet in a variety of ways and harming our society. Um, we're exploiting ourselves to work harder and in more instrumental ways, and the planet can't bear much more output. And there is a kind of grim logic of our age which is that productivity grows by exponential increase, but efficiencies grow by exponential decay. And the more efficient you get, the less waste there is left to save by efficiency. But the more you produce, the more an additional increment of productivity will produce in also waste. So the logic is such that productivity is gonna have to end its growth at some point soon. And the final point I wanna just end on is that leads us to have to ask a very fundamental question, which is what is the purpose of work when Smith's mantra has outlived its usefulness? What is the point of production when we have enough or even too much consumption? And how should we structure our work lives so that work is not a technology to productivity, but a process that is valuable in itself, 
what's it like to work individually to make meaning in our lives, and what's it like to work together so that the workplace becomes a site of community, of democratic collaboration, and is valuable in the doing of the job rather than for the output. Martin, for, for a significant proportion of people, then Daniel's asking, uh, uh, saying we shouldn't be pursuing productivity. Would you agree? Up to a point. Um, a lot of up to a points on the panel. I, 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 I will do my best to clarify our positions. Martin. Well, I tend to think that I, this is where I've ended up now in my late 70s, that most of life consists of painful trade-offs without simple answers. I hate to say that, and I'm not going to change that view just because you'd like me to, because the tendency of some people to regard all the material and associated progress of the last 200 years as a snare and delusion is a pretty mildly a very serious mistake. Among other things, about 80% of you would not be alive. The population growth, obviously, is a function of that. One of the problems creating success creates problems. Uh, and um, in addition to the bottom billion who are borderline destitute, the sort of people who, as a result of COVID and the disruption of COVID, have died in very large numbers, which we don't think about. I've written about this. So poverty matters, right? And the ability to cope with trauma like COVID for societies was immeasurably increased by the fact that we're just so rich. We could do something. I'm not saying it was wise or not, but we couldn't have even imagined before, which was in response to a major disease, close down large parts of the economy and stay at home. That's because we were so rich and productive and other countries couldn't. And I would say something like three quarters to 80% of humanity, and that would be consistent with Daniel's figures, are still in the, the realm in which higher output per head will make a great deal of difference. The second point I would make is even if we don't want productivity per head in aggregate, we still need a hell of a lot of innovation, which is really what productivity is about. To me, it's the ability to do more with less. Well, what's interesting about um, the US, the UK, and the then Soviet Union and now Russia, which most people probably wouldn't have picked up on right away, but I think it's sometimes it's, you know, if you've come from a different vantage point, you see things that others don't. I mean, all of us, again, will have had that experience. Is that they're going through the same kind of industrial transitions in roughly the same um, amount of time. So, I mean, they're, they're the three of the greatest um, industrial powers. Of course, you know, the Soviet Union was all done by central planning and, you know, forced industrialization, gulag labor, you know, the whole thing here, which was, wasn't quite the same in the United States and the UK, though I think, you know, we can also say things were very harsh, you know, for workers at different points. But they start to go into decline, industrial decline, in around the same time. And of course, the Soviet Union is the ultimate land of big smokestack factories, factories and workers, you know, the state of factories and workers. And it's subsidizing everything. So, you know, the, the disaster has staved off a lot longer than it is in the UK and in the United States. But one thing that I isn't fully appreciate in the UK, the whole north of England and the Midlands is all, in, is all um, nationalized in, in a way that it isn't really, you know, down here in the south. Because after World War II, all of the businesses were, you know, basically on the verge of bankruptcy, having been cut off from uh, the rest of the world economy for five months. And all the big industrialists, the kind of people that you would have heard of in the past, the Vickers, the Armstrongs, Furness, I mean, these are all bells. All these are kind of names that you'll read in a history book. Um, they, they all disappear. And instead, you get British Steel, British Coal, British Rail. When I was growing up, I didn't know anybody who didn't work for the state one way or another. And so when I went to the Soviet Union, I immediately thought, oh, this is just like home. You know, everybody works for the the government, you know, one way or another. My dad worked for British Coal and he worked briefly for British Steel and he worked for the National Health Service. My mother was a midwife in the National Health Service. I, the only people I knew had their own business were, you know, a plumber, the local electrician or the people in the corner shop. So, you know, you've got a kind of a, a different perspective growing up in, in an area like that. And so, you know, the Soviet Union, of course, the, the Bolshevik Revolution removes any kind of private property, but there wasn't really any private property beforehand. And then when I went to the United States, of course, you'd think something would be completely different because you don't have any nationalization after World War II in the United States, but you do have these huge steel plants and coal mines and uh, car manufacturing. And all of the people's lives and welfare are tied up with that as well, because I'm sure you're all aware that, you know, there's, there's no health service in uh, the United States. It's all tied to the workplace, which also was a feature of World War II. And it was to stop people from moving from place to place in their, in their factories and to keep wages down during the war. 
So in a way, what Americans are really thinking about it, their workers become indentured or trapped into their workplace, which is just what you have in the Soviet Union and, you know, you have, you know, in the United Kingdom to some degree. So when all of the big industries go into decline because of, you know, the global trends, workers there suddenly find themselves totally dislocated. And in the case of the United States, they lose their, all their benefits, they lose their health care. They also, you know, the same as, you know, here in the UK, you know, they, they lose all of this amenities, all the leisure. It's all tied to those, you know, the Bethlehem Steelworks or something like this as well. So they go through that same pattern as well, just in a slightly different tie. Now, you don't notice it in the US because a lot of people used to move around, but you get these incredible pockets of poverty and deprivation in places like Michigan. Ohio, Pennsylvania, the whole Appalachia, which is just like the Northeast, and it's like the Donbass and, and the Kuzbass and all these areas and Urals in um, the Soviet Union. And in Russia, Putin becomes the product of this post-industrial collapse in the 1990s. The shock therapy, which is very much like the, you know, the whole privatization in the 1980s here in the UK, which all happened at once and lots of people out of work. And Putin, you know, basically comes on into power in 1999 saying, I'm going to make Russia great again. Sounds familiar, right? And uh, he's, well, I don't think he's made it great, but, you know, he's certainly done something to it in the last um, 23 years that he's been in power. In, you know, the UK, of course, we, you know, with, with Brexit and all the debates over this, it, it, people yeah. suddenly started to realise that whole swathes of the United Kingdom felt completely left behind because in the northeast of England, immense grievance that was being expressed in the Brexit vote, not for take back control and sovereignty, but more like nobody's been developing here, nobody's been investing here. You know, for the last 30, 40 years, we're told that it's all because all the money is going to Brussels. So now what's going to happen? Which is why leveling up is now on the agenda. But, you know, people in my family said, well, all the money's going to Brussels. That's why, you know, we have no factories or we've got no jobs and things now. I'm just putting it a bit crudely, but that's kind of the way that what, some people saw this. Well, that's, that's what, what they, they were, were told being told. In that exactly. Campaign, yeah. And then in, you know, the United States, people are being told, well, your jobs have gone to China or they've gone to Mexico. This actually is true <laughs> in many respects because of the whole global shifts. But they're also feeling like they're being left behind and nobody cares about them anymore. So along comes Trump. He's going to make America great again. And he wins election in 2016 by a margin of 70 to 77,000 votes in three counties in three states, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, all of which have gone through exactly the same post-industrial decline that parts of uh, Russia and uh, the United Kingdom have gone through. And it's the same sense of grievance when you go to talk to people as you, you, know, you hear in those places too. So we reflexively approach pleasure and avoid pain. We don't have to think about that. That is how we are innately wired over millions of years of evolution. In fact, we have to think about doing the opposite. So it's not a matter of should we abandon this reflex. We are we have limited capacity, although some capacity to do so. What's at issue here is the ways in which this ancient wiring, which has us reflexively approaching pleasure and avoiding pain, is mismatched for the modern ecosystem in which almost every aspect of human life has become drugified in some way or another. What do I mean by drugified? I mean made more reinforcing, releases more dopamine in our brain's reward pathway, made more ubiquitous, easier to access, meaning that 24 seven, we can get cupcakes, cocaine and pornography uh, whenever we want. Um, and also uh, made uh, more novel. So more novel by adding new molecules to old drugs, by combining uh, behavioral or process drugs like um, singing and a competition in American Idol, making all of our lives now reinforcing. In fact, you might even argue that the dark side of successful capitalism is to turn us all into addicts. So therefore, because our ancient wiring is mismatched for this modern ecosystem, we now have a new mandate, a new and unprecedented mandate, where we have to intentionally insulate ourselves from these reinforcing stimuli in order to be in balance with our ancient wiring, with our bodies, with this ecosystem. And if we don't do that, if we relentlessly pursue pleasure, as it seems we are doing now, especially in rich nations, we will end up in this dopamine deficit state, which is our neurological response uh, in the process of becoming addicted. Uh, and we will end up more depressed, more anxious, um, and overall less happy with our lives. A very interesting trend with happiness surveys was that prior to about 2000, 
as wealth increased in a given nation, happiness went up. But starting about 20 years ago, uh, in those same countries, uh, happiness started to go down. And so I really do think it does beg the question, even if, especially since it's purely subjective, what is happening there? What's the phenomenon? I would 100% agree that dopamine is not some, you know, simple um, process. And then you can say dopamine equals pleasure. And in fact, I don't say that in my book, and I never have said that, you know, dopamine is a, a neurotransmitter that's essential for the experience of pleasure and motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. If you don't like the subjectivity measure um, that comes inherently with measuring people's depression or anxiety or happiness levels, then let's look at death. And if you don't like deaths of despair, let's look at global deaths. So some 60 to 70 percent of global deaths today are caused by diseases that are due to modifiable risk factors. The top three are obesity. The second one is being sedentary. And the third is smoking. So the point here is that we are now dying in unprecedented numbers from lifestyle diseases. The number one killer is no longer infectious diseases, okay, COVID notwithstanding for a brief period of time, or cancer, or, th or accidents. Uh, it's people essentially killing themselves through their behaviors. And it's not fun. It's, this is not about going to grandma's house and having too much fun. I, I wish that it were. Uh, this is about people who are really, really miserable and who really have lost some degree of autonomy because of the way that these potent reinforcers hijack our reward it, system. Politeness, there's a thing I haven't thought about for a long time. It's a word that doesn't really uh, come up much in society. And I think partly, the reason for that is, is for perhaps the last 20 years, uh, we've been using a different word for politeness. We've been calling it political correctness. And we've been engaged in perhaps what you might call war on empathy. Anybody who shows politeness uh, or are careful in what they say is castigated as, uh, as weak or uh, uh, virtue signaling. And consequently, um, those kind of ideas of politeness have been uh, um, pushed to the back of our culture. And it troubles me greatly because I'm in the empathy business. Music is all about empathy. It's the currency of what we do. Music is trying to get you to feel something for uh, an emotion for something you yourself may not have encountered. Or perhaps you draw some empathy from the music itself. So. To see empathy castigated in such a way by people who use terms like political correctness, when really that what they're talking about is, is uh, a politeness, really, really troubles me. Because everybody fundamentally has the right to be treated with dignity and respect, whatever their position. You know, in debate, that can change, as has always been, already been mentioned by Sophie, that sometimes you do have to uh, take people on. But our starting point has to be one of dignity and respect. But that does need to touch on a little bit more about what we're going to move on to later. Sometimes that does need to be, if not enforced, then at least given some parameters. Last week in London, the National Conservative Conference took place, the, uh, the Nazis, as we call them. And uh, they, uh, they were talking a lot about freedom of speech which they saw as a fundamental good. And very often the people who were talking about it were the very people who used the term political correctness over the last few decades. And their uh, idea of uh, <clears throat> the parameters of free speech, it has to have some kind of parameters. Uh, they saw the parameters of free speech as being duty and responsibility. And I have a little bit of a problem with that because I think responsibility, duty, you're relying on the individual to mark their own homework. You know, being, uh, we, we say we take responsibility uh, implies that it's something that we ourselves, belongs to us ourselves to uh, take that step rather than be encouraged to do it. Whereas when we say we hold someone to account, we're suggesting the ability of someone outside of the individual having uh, uh, some uh, control over that person and what they say. And I think that 
Part of the problem that we have with the lack of politeness is to do with the lack of accountability. Most obviously online, most obviously um, in our social media discourse, uh, there are no parameters there whatsoever. And what parameters there were on Twitter have now been thrown away by the free speech absolutist, uh, Elon Musk. And so I think the balance between free speech and uh, uh, accountability is out of whack. And I think if we could find a way to bring accountability back into balance with free speech, that would, uh, in effect, bring politeness uh, back into our, into our cultural discourse, perhaps not just online, but all the way uh, to the very top, uh, to uh, our, our, those who govern us. I, like many string theorists, think that we live once. I'm not interested in spending my time on a theory that's wrong. And so being able to make that experimental judgment is, is, would be wonderful. We can't do it yet. I agree with that. But that's not some fundamental failing of the theory. It's the failing of us theorists to understand the theory well enough to make those predictions. Final point I will make is in terms of connection to physics, and there are others that I could bring up, but let me just focus on one. We've known Roger, of course, since the work of you, work of Stephen Hawking, about, for instance, black hole entropy. And string theory is still the only framework within which we can calculate from first principles for a certain category of black holes and reproduce the beautiful formula that Stephen Hawking wrote down in terms of the area of the event horizon divided by four. And so there's a wonderful connection between a quality of the world that I think many of us agree is correct, that black holes have entropy governed by the area of the event horizon, and string theories calculation from first principles for certain categories of black holes of that number. So that, again, among many other things that we could discuss, are links to physics. So I'm a little surprised that you would say there's no connection to physics, but perhaps I'll leave it there and happy to hear your response. I, I think we would all love to see the experimental verification. It's just a, a technical issue of reaching those energies. Um, and I think there's no string theorist who would not want verification. And I don't know of any string theorist who says it's not needed. Right? We, we all agree that that is what we're working towards. We just think it's going to take a lot longer than usual to get there. And to that point, I just want to say, I mean, we're used to thinking that these experimental, um, I, don't, I don't even know what to call them, devices, apparatus, I mean, something as huge as LIGO or, uh, you know, the, the colliders at CERN, we can see what goes into them, right? We see how finely they have to be calibrated. We see the amount of material they take. So it's easy for us to see how complicated they are. I just want to suggest that the, the reason we haven't solved all the theoretical problems is that the math is equally complex. It's just not material. You can't see it. But there's a lot of things that have to be literally as finely tuned as that LIGO laser beam. Um, there's a lot of math that has to be developed. There's a lot of frameworks that you know, we need to come up with. Um, string theory is sort of forcing us to, to develop all of these things. It's not, they're not pre-existing. So yes, it's taking time. Um, and I think those of us who are motivated by it are willing to give it that time. I understand. So the, the theory calls for 10 dimensions. Maybe six of them have to get rolled up. They have a very small di diameter. That means that you're going to take a lot of energy to excite it, which means that there's an energy threshold uh, beyond which you hope that you can make predictions, but we haven't gotten there yet. That would apply to every other theory that might be a rival to string theory. But if you try to tell string theorists, hey, I have a different theory, it makes particle predictions, it says exactly what the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 quantum numbers are, they'll say at what energy level? And you say, I don't know. And they'll say, well, then it's not a prediction. It's not, your, your theory is not real. And you say, well, you just pulled a maneuver much worse than that. You won't even tell me what those things are. And so you have to understand how this game is actually played. The fact is, is that string theorists will always tell you that if the better theory came along, that they would immediately move to it. But what do you think about this modern stuff going on about AI? And people, <laughs> I'm, people the claiming chalk, that yes. they, can, they can create things uh, by using these AI devices. Do you have a comment to make on that? Well, I 
I just find it, it's so hard to sort of understand and believe in something that to me doesn't seem real. But I feel if there was some other member of our panel who was maybe in their teens or 20s, they might be the one to answer it. For me, I, I just don't understand it enough. Well, you've used the right word in my view. The word is understand. That these devices don't understand a thing. And so that they can do some imitation of, of conversation or something like that. And you realize after a while it doesn't understand anything, not what it's talking about. <laughs> but th it's a very difficult concept to, to grasp, the notion of understanding. For, for several hundred years we've been making better and better simulacrum simulacra of human beings. They started with very, in the 18th century, rigid looking mechanisms. And we've just got a hell of a lot better at it. Oh, yes, but yes. it sounds asymptotic. You, you, you get closer and closer to what you're thinking of, but you never achieve it because you're just doing a better and better mock-up, which isn't what it is that you're, what we are. Well, the thing is, it's not conscious. Well, in absolutely. In my view, that's the trouble. Um, yeah, See, these devices... quite important, yes. So these devices don't well you have to have a view about what you think consciousness is which i have and i don't think uh -huh. i should bore people about that <laughs> but, uh, the thing Go is on. that these devices <laughs> as currently d constructed would not in any stretch of my imagination anyway become conscious and that you can ascertain this fact in in conversation with the device so after a while Look, it doesn't have a faintest idea what it's talking about. It, it comes up with phrases, a lot of knowledge there. You see, I think that one of the troubles is that the term AI is just misleading. It's not artificial intelligence. It's artificial cleverness or knowledge. knowledge uh, or I say AI like stands for artificial information processing. It That's has nothing to do with intelligence. I completely agree with you. Or no creativity, yeah. in fact. Yes. Yes. Or creativity. Mm. Maybe One people thing need I love the individual subtlety so of people's own individual oh, sure. brains and mm. that that's what's missing or that's certainly what it always feels like. Yes. Yes, there was somebody who in the 80s produced a computer that by feeding all of the works of Bach into it, it could produce a simulacrum of a work by Bach. But the great thing about Bach was that he wasn't a simulacrum of anything. <laughs> His very first com composition at the age of 19 is staggering for its originality and is completely, today, the, one of the most moving pieces of music he wrote. So we really mustn't mix human beings up with machines. Organisms are not machines. But what I loved was when you said something about I, I, in, the, in my 20s, I almost wrote a book called Against Perfection or In Praise of Imperfection. But what is so important is this non-completion, the, the openness of something that is ever ongoing in its creativity. And you, you, when you said those sort of incompletenesses or gaps, I then thought, well, if there were no gaps, to coin a phrase, how would the light get in?